Vickeries. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Brian O'Driscoll on Off the Ball. You're very welcome back. The Guinness Pro 14 returns this weekend, albeit in quite unusual circumstances, with derbies across the competition. Two interprovincial matches will take place at the Aviva Stadium behind closed doors. Leinster against Munster, with Munster still eyeing up top spot in their conference. Leinster are already qualified as a home semi finalist, uh, given the remarkable season they've had domestically so far this year. While Ulster can book their place in the last four as the runners up in Conference A if they can beat Connacht. Ulster need one win in their last two fixtures. They play Leinster in their last game uh, for the chance to qualify for the last four of the competition. Leinster and Ulster also in the final stages of their preparation for their quarterfinals in the Heineken Champions Cup, which are coming up on the third weekend of next month. To break it all down into this weekend of return, we're joined by Ireland rugby legend Brian O'Driscoll. Brian, how are things? Good evening, Will. How are you? Actually, look, I'm not too bad. I mean, we've got to this point where rugby is coming back. It's felt like a long time away, uh, given that those teams were just getting into that kind of point of the season where the Six Nations was about to come to a close, they were getting ready for quarterfinals in Europe and the tail end of the Pro 14, and then everything just has to halt down for three or four months. Yeah, I think as players, you, you look at the season of, uh, in stages, you know, you try and just battle through pre-season, just graft it out and get it done. And then the early work is to try and set your, yourself up for uh, later on for the business end of the season to be in the mix and be that, you know, um, domestic league and the Pro 14 or, or into qualification to knockout stages of Europe. So, uh, you know, two of the, uh, of the Irish teams managed to make Champions Cup uh, quarterfinals. Um, you know, there's potential for three to be in the semifinals of the Pro 14. So they were in rude health, even if the national team probably struggled a little bit in this year's Six Nations. And it, it is nice sometimes when I came off plenty of disappointing Six Nations, but having that carrot of playing in uh, a European quarterfinal is, is something to really relish and something to look forward to. And no doubt these players, after six months sitting on their hands, you know, training hard, getting their guns big, um, they're looking forward to getting out, even though it is going to be a very different atmosphere that they're, that's going to greet them on Saturday. Well, guns being big, we've seen the transformation pictures of some of the players. Bundy Aki, uh, who will be joining us on Saturday's programme, uh, put on definitely a little bit of mass. Andy Friend was saying he's like a caged animal. And Johnny Sexton appears to have been in the gym quite a bit during the off-season too. We saw some of the pictures where uh, he's coming back a little bit bulked up too. I guess it's understandable given the amount of gym work these guys were probably doing individually. Yeah, I, I think you've also to to realise that during the course of a, of a season, there isn't that much of an opportunity to um, to build your body into the way you want it to be. Um, you know, the games come thick and fast, and it's very hard to uh, be able to focus on you know building muscle mass or building strength or looking after certain injuries. So it, it was a very unique situation that they found themselves in, where they could literally focus on themselves, not have to worry about the team component and concentrate on getting themselves right. And for some people that it'll work, have worked an absolute um, treat, you know, guys that would have had long-term injuries, I suppose the likes of Jonathan Davis in, in Wales comes to mind, who had a, a very bad knee injury at the World Cup. And, you know, knowing that you're going to miss the rest of the season, but then it getting cut short, I suppose from, from his perspective, it, it was an added bonus that, that the pan pandemic did come in and gave him an opportunity not to miss game time. Whereas, there's other players, older players like Johnny Sexton, you know, who's 35 now, um, who you know is, has talked about wanting to play week on week because that's when he gets the most out of himself. Uh, even though coaches are trying to protect him now and watch his minutes, um, you know, time is starting to to run out for him. He's running out of runway. We don't want to retire him, send him to pasture yet, but. Um, you know, how many 36, 37, 38 year old out halves are there? Not very many. So he's definitely come well into the winter of his career. So he must be desperate to get back and, and getting some game time um, knowing that, you know, the end's not too far away. I spoke to Jordan Lammer last Thursday evening and he was saying that this gave him kind of a unique opportunity too because generally he's thinking about international games back into playing for Leinster. You're trying to get a break before pre-season, then you're back into pre-season and all the focus is on getting fit for the next campaign. He said he had a bit of extra time, particularly he was looking to try and improve himself at 15. He was working on his high fielding, he was working on his kicking. This pandemic has actually provided a pretty unique opportunity for some of these players maybe to hone some of those skills that in the normal course of a rugby season, they wouldn't get that kind of reflective time. 
No, they wouldn't. And I think it's good to look at glass half full where you have an opportunity to hone the skills, the deficiencies that maybe lie within your game. But the reality is, you know, you are missing out on playing, you know, high level uh, club and, and international games and nothing beats that. So, you know, credit to those players that saw the opportunity to, you know, develop themselves as players. Some players went off and finished third level um, courses that they that you know had had been mulling over some people went and and found new um you know new skills to um to keep them you know to help pass the time and so on so um yeah i, I think it's important to try and look at these last four or five months and see what you've achieved as a player and how you can come back and hit the ground running um obviously there's not much of a lead-in time to playing international games in the october and november windows so you know, you really do not have an opportunity like you might in other seasons to warm into things, play four or five games and still hit peak form to uh, to impress the international coaches. Um, that's not going to be the case. You're going to have to be very good, you know, by game two, three, uh, if you're going to find yourself playing in the green jersey uh, in a couple of months' time. And realistically, Brian, how rusty can we expect players to be this weekend? Because... They had to come back initially in smaller group sessions and they were training as forwards and backs and they've only really had a few weeks now to prepare properly in match situations. Can we expect ring rust in these two games this weekend? Absolutely. It's it, like, when have they had a six-month preseason? When have they had that level of time away other than on a long-term injury? It never, it never happens. So, of course, you're going to have uh, ring rust. You're going to have guys that... Um, you know, will struggle to get to the pace of the game, no matter what level of cardio that they, they would have done in person or as a team over the last few weeks. And nothing we talk about that match fitness is very, very hard to replicate in training. So um, there will be frustrations from crowd. You, you will expect them, you know, to see the standard of what we saw down in New Zealand from the off. I think it'll, it'll take a while to get to the level that we would be hopeful for. But I think these players are so looking forward to it that if anything, you know, they might end up trying too hard uh, of, you know, of, of hitting their straps immediately. And I think the way to play themselves in is just doing the simple things well, um, you know, try and minimize mistakes and get into the, into the game plan of whatever team they're playing for uh, and, and work as, as units. And progressively, they'll get better over the next three or four weeks. But it's an exciting time. They've had to be patient. I've spoken to a number of players over the course of the last few months and it is hard. It's it's been hard for everyone, but it's it's been hard from that for, from their perspective because um, you know the, you you live in, as a professional rugby player for the big occasion. You don't live to train and to get yourself in in perfect condition. You live to play in the big encounters against the monsters and the international teams. Um, so they've had to sit that out and and now bide their time. Well, a rugby coverage here and off the ball with thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Before we look at the fixtures themselves, Brian, you know, bad news again for Joey Carberry. Very frustrating news for him. He's had a horrific 16 months with injuries, probably going back to that initial ankle injury, then re-injuring it against Edinburgh. He just about gets back for the World Cup warm-ups last summer. Then he hurts his knee against Italy. And then he ends up basically having to nurse that injury for a long period of time. We were hopeful that he was going to be back to hit the ground running for the series internationally and also for the end of the season with Munster. Now an indefinite period that he's been ruled out for. He's just been horrifically unlucky these last 16 months. Yeah, he has. And, and you know, you could only speculate as to, as to whether, you know, being rushed back for the World Cup, you know, caused longer term effects to, um, to that ankle. I'm sure it certainly didn't, didn't help him. Um, but yeah, you, you, you really feel for the guy. He's, he's an incredibly talented footballer. He's gone and made the difficult decision to go down and play for, you know, his home uh, province's biggest rivals. Um, he's ingratiated himself in the setup. Um, he's a, a clearly very popular player amongst his peers. Um, he's, you know, the few, a few occasions that we did get to see him last year before the World Cup, he was on fire. Um, he's had some brilliant um, individual performances in, um, in a brand that maybe they, they haven't seen for a while and helping them develop that. Um, so it must be hugely frustrating from his own point of view, but also from Johan van Graan and Stephen Larkham's point of view that they haven't been able to get the best out of a player that um, they need that quality of talent to lead them and guide them around the park if they're going to go and win some silverware. I have to say, it sounds pretty bad. 
Um, the fact that, you know, the terminology that they're using, you know, we're really going to look after um, Joey uh, for an indefinite period of time. It certainly sounds as though potential for another surgery in there and, and we're not going to see him um, in the next, you know, two, three, four months. So I suppose from everyone in Ireland, we, we wish him well and, and hope that he does uh, return to, to form, um, to his previous form. Not only is it not good for, for Munster, it's not good for Ireland because if you look at um, our other 10s and the level of experience that they have, you know, we've obviously Johnny Sexton at 35 years of age, but Jack Carty didn't quite happen for him at the, at the World Cup and, um, and struggled a little bit with his provincial team after that. Billy Burns... Uh, uncapped, Ian Madigan coming back in, being away from the international setup for, for a while. Uh, Ross Byrne, you know, a limited international experience. Harry Byrne, lots of talent. So it's not only Munster's, um, you know, struggles uh, in the number 10 jersey, backup for Johnny Sexton and, and pressure on trying to displace Johnny Sexton is what we thought Joey Carberry was going to provide, um, certainly after the World Cup, but it just hasn't materialised because of this bad run of luck. Because there's a feeling out there, Brian, that maybe this opens the door perfectly for Ian Madigan. He comes back to these shores, he's eligible to play again. Potentially he could get back in with Ulster as early as this weekend. But he is going to have to try and displace Burns, who was really impressive for Ulster last year. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I've obviously played with Ian Madigan and, and I'm an Ian Madigan fan. But, um, you know, you come into a new environment um, you know, they've given him a one-year contract, so straight away he has to hit the ground running to try and impress because whatever about, you know, trying to get back and play for Ireland, he's also thinking about his livelihood of, you know, of next year and no player wants a one-year contract. So he's going to put extra pressure on himself to deliver for, for Ulster. There will be a pecking order. I, I wouldn't imagine Dan McFarlane will be throwing Ian Madigan in uh, immediately as, as his first choice number 10. The other thing is because John Cooney is such an exceptionally good goal kicker that that's a facet of Ian Madigan's play that's got him selected in teams over the course of the last number of years that maybe doesn't actually shine as much of a light on on what he brings to the team um even though he's a very proficient footballer so you know he has I, I, I don't know is it the World Cup in 2015 was uh, or maybe 2016 was the last time he played uh, in a green jersey um you know sides move on and it's hard to delve back into those that have been there and have been in um, in the shadows for a number of years. Um, I think looking at the, the other possibilities coming through, you, you've got to read between the lines with Andy Farrell's selection of, um, of uh, Harry um, from Leinster. Um, Harry Byrne coming in. Byrne, sorry. Uh, Harry Byrne getting brought into the, um, into the Six Nations setup um, you know, for, the, for you know, training purposes. You have to imagine that he's going to be a firm favourite of, of Andy Farrell. So maybe it's time to blood one of these younger guys and, and get them game time and get them experience if they're going to be the ones that are going to take this team forward you know, to France in 2023. In terms of Munster's number 10 position for what could be their three remaining games of the season, everything is now in the JJ Hanrahan basket at this point. Tyler Blindall has been forced into retirement. That injury for Joey Carberry. Johan van Graan was asked at the press conference this week if they would consider looking for short-term cover and he says he's fully backing JJ Hanrahan. He's the top scorer in the Pro 14 this year, Brian. He's got over 100 points scored already. He seems to put in some good performances just before the break, led them to three victories just before the pandemic. Is JJ Hanrahan good enough to lead Munster potentially to a Pro 14 title though? Um... I'm not. I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I, I like JJ as a as a footballer, but I guess it's well documented he hasn't had the consistency needed to be able to guide a team like, like Munster to to um, to the holy grail of of obviously Europe. But you know, but even since 2011, they haven't managed to win the Pro 14 or or Celtic League as it was all those years ago. So. Um, there is a lot of pressure on him. I think if you look at the, the three understudies underneath him, Flannery, um, Healy and, and Jack Crowley, um, you know, these guys have barely any experience between them. So it does put a huge amount of pressure on JJ. Um, teams will definitely go after him as a player, knowing that there's not much backup um, and trying to, you know, legally, um, you know, put pressure on him and, and um, see if they can get him to exit the field early on with the knowledge that there, there's huge inexperience at such a key position within the Munster ranks. You would anticipate 
that Munster will definitely be on the lookout for a more experienced uh, out half to uh, be a short term replacement for Joey Carberry. Um, I've heard a few different names being bandied around in the papers, Quade Cooper and an aging um, uh, Cart Dan Carter. But um, I, I think they have to look at something else. I don't think you can rely on just JJ Hanrahan to play all those you know, big games for him um, with the knowledge that you know one soft tissue injury or one knock would find um, one of those much more inexperienced players coming in and trying to guide them to that silverware. Dare I suggest it, that if we get another potential loan between the provinces, if Harry Byrne is looking impressive, but he's clearly behind his brother and also Jonathan Sexton at Leinster, that the RFU could say, hey, here's a chance for Harry Byrne to play some first team rugby. I, I don't think Leinster are going to give uh, Harry Byrne up like they might have um, some other players. I think the realisation is that he is the future. I think there's a strong likelihood this year that he's going to leapfrog over his brother into being the number two, uh, being the, in the Leinster 23 this season. I, I've been incredibly impressed with a couple of performances that I've seen by him. He's a, a different sort of 10 to, to his brother. He really attacks the line. Uh, he's very huge confidence in his own running game. I think he's a massive threat, but also has an ability to throw the pass really late. So he, um, he, he is of the Johnny Sexton mold, but if if having a lot more ability to get through the space and the gap himself. You know, he's got younger legs um, and he's got the confidence of youth as well to, uh, to take that on. So I, I'd anticipate it, um, that, that he'll, you know, get himself into the, the reckoning in, at Leinster and he'll put a lot of pressure on Johnny Sexton over the next season, 18 months, uh, to, to potentially displace him. Well, Munster have got one win in their last 11 trips to Dublin. But they've got two very interesting signings that have just arrived, Brian, and the pandemic has given them time uh, to ease, first of all, the groin injury for Damien de Alande to get him back fully fit. I will also argue Sneeman is back and has had three or four weeks of training now. Both are available for this weekend. Peter Romani was saying they brought a winning attitude to Limerick off the back of winning the World Cup. He thinks they're two signings that could maybe move them to the next level. How big are these two South Africans going to be for Munster in the coming seasons? I think they're a huge signing for, for two huge signings for Munster. Um, I, I, I probably agree with um, with Peter Omani that um, they, they, they do bring that winning mentality. Can you imagine the confidence that a World Cup success must bring you as a player and as, uh, as an athlete? Um, you know, Damien Delande, um, there was question marks about you know, him starting in that Springbok team, but he was undoubtedly one of the players of the tournament, um, turned in a huge uh, final performance against England as well. Um, Snayman came off the bench in most games and was, uh, you know, a, a one-man destruction ball, um, carrying ball, offloading, sucking defenders in, played exactly to the game plan that South Africa wanted. So what I think the two of them do um, brilliantly well is they're able to, to mix their game up. They do bring that brute force, but they do bring that ability to change the point of contact as well. And as soon as you think they're crashing into contact, they have the sleight of hand to be able to release it to other players and, 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 and move the ball to different channels. And I think that's what you need. If you become a predictable player, you know, you'll, you'll find yourself getting gang tackled. You have to have that um, flexibility to play a multitude of different types of game. And I think that's what these two players bring in spades. I, I couldn't believe that Snayman's only 25, Dialanda is only 28. So we've got these players in the prime of um, of their athleticism. Um, and this is the time that you want to get international caliber players. You don't want to get them when you know, they're coming for their payday, for their pension at 32, 33. Um, you want to get them while they're coming into the peak of, of their form. And you know, I, looking back, probably 27, 28, um, with the level of experience you get before that playing international rugby, and, but then not having too many miles on the clock is is the perfect age to come in. And watching Snayman down in Japan, it looked as though it was underage rugby at times with him taking on uh, players in the J-League. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited from a, um, from a rugby spectator perspective. Uh, I definitely think they'll add, beside the ballast um, they'll bring to, to Munster, I think you know, training with these guys and seeing um, the confidence that they exude, I think the players will feed off that down in Munster. And, It'll make them a very different proposition if they can uh, get their number 10 sorted or if J.J. Hanrahan continues some of the early season form. 
Brian, how do your old team Leinster approach the next month now? We're one month out from this quarterfinal against Saracens in the European Cup. They could potentially win their third successive Pro 14 before that. There's a lot of games coming up over the next four or five weeks. Leinster know they've already qualified for the semis. They know they've got a home semi-final. If you're Leo Cullen, how much do you mix it up over the next few weeks just to make sure your team stays fresh? Yeah, I think you do absolutely mix it up. Um, I think they have the capabilities of doing that, though. I think we've seen over the course of the season to go unbeaten uh, and to use as many players as they have used is testament to the quality of the training and the realization as players come in that they're just co a cog in the wheel. Um, and uh, and you know, you're sometimes you lose uh, an, a world class international operator and some of the a younger player from the academy comes in and it doesn't it looks like a seamless transition. Um, and that's the, the quality of the depth of Leinster at the moment. They have so much talent coming off the assembly line. Um, you look at the quality of their academy, you look at the quality of their sub-academy even. Guys that are coming off playing in Ireland schools, being um, tipped as, as future internationals, but not even ab able to get into the Leinster academy, such as the strength of it. So they, they are in, a, in, in rude health at the moment. Um, they will want to go this season unbeaten. I, I'm sure they haven't said it out publicly, but the fact that they've gone to this point uh, in, you know, in the league unbeaten, um, they've gone six for six, am I right in saying that, in, in Europe as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's definitely something that they will have talked about behind closed doors as, you know, you talk about um, the Arsenal um, team of... Um, of Vieira and, and Petit and, and the Invincibles, um, they will want to try and um, do that double-double that, that uh, very few teams have, have managed to do. Um, and to go an, an unbeaten season would be a remarkable feat. The added bonus is that there's every likelihood that they could play all the remaining um, seven, six, seven games uh, in the Aviva Stadium. Um, so what a, what a great carrot that is too. So... Um, it starts with a good performance against Munster and, and build, you know, continuing to build on the confidence that they developed over the course of the first seven or eight months of the year. Um, and it'll take a very good team um, playing some excellent rugby on, on the day uh, to beat this Leinster side. When it comes to Aviva Stadium, and this is going to be true of both games this weekend, they will have played captain's run, some of these players with their international teams. But it's going to be very unusual to be in a cavernous stadium with just 100 support staff around them this weekend, no fans for what would have been two big fixtures in the normal calendar. It's going to be very strange. Yeah, it is going to be odd. Um, but you know, I, I, I'm hating the term the new normal, but I think you, you, you find what normal is, the new normal, very quickly because through repetition and because you have to adapt to those new circumstances that you find yourself in. Um, you know, listening to guys... Um, you know, wearing masks at team meetings must seem absolutely alien for the first week or two, but now it becomes second nature, and and that's just what's expected of you. Um, all the all the different elements of travelling to the game in two different buses and what you can and can't do, all these things seem alien a, a couple of months ago, but now they're so desperate to play that it becomes second nature. So um, I, I, it'll be interesting from a spectator point of view hearing the chat, hearing how vocal certain players are and who those individuals are. You know, it was always Sean O'Brien. You, you know, anytime you look back over footage of a game watching internationally, it's always Sean O'Brien's voice on the ref mic where there's no Sean O'Brien anymore. So who takes over that mantle? Who's going to be the one that's driving the standards, constantly communicating, constantly, you know, giving quality feedback to teammates, um, you know, get, getting them up when a mistake has been made, um, you know, putting pressure on the referee for good decisions, all of those small little things add up in conversation piece. And we're going to be um, in a front row ticket of, of listening and hearing all of that because we're going to get limited background noise. I know um, different broadcasters are using some FX sound, um, you know, but those players are going to be playing in an environment where it'll be deadly silent. It'll always be like a, a trial match, like a possibles versus probables. And, you know, playing um, for your international place. So um, what will be interesting, I was listening to Rory O'Connor early on in the week, what will be interesting is is teams trying to work out the other side's um, calls, calls yeah. and, you know, understanding when you play off nine and off 10. And I think that's where there's going to have to be an adaptability to have multiple calls, playing off nine, playing off 10, playing off 12, rather than just 
talking turbo or tiger or whatever the trigger might be because very quickly sides will work that out um so it'll be interesting to see who who adapts to that best when it comes to international selection by my maths, Connacht need an absolute miracle if they're going to qualify. They need to win both games of bonus points for Scarlets to get fewer points than they do in the last two fixtures. And they would need Munster to lose both games without even picking up a losing bonus point. So Connacht know at this stage they've got two games left in their season. For their players who want to impress Andy Farrell ahead of these six international games that are now left, I guess that's Connacht's motivation for the next two games. Yeah, it is. And... Um it's a, it's unlikely that we're going to see you know too many bolters coming out of Connacht that haven't you know previously played international rugby because of the injuries in the second row with um, with Ian Henderson in in, um, in Ulster and James Ryan with with Leinster and the question marks over their eligibility um, you know with with fitness come uh, October November is there an opportunity for Gavin Thornbury potentially to um, to, to pave his way into uh, an inter international space within the 23 or in the reckoning, perhaps. So uh, a big couple of weeks for him. Um, I think there's a pressure um, that's taken off Connacht because the unlike the high unlikelihood of them qualifying. So they're able to go out and play their way and play with a freedom. And I think if they play as a unit, that's the best way that you know more of those Connacht players are going to find themselves uh, within that that Irish reckoning, but for me, it'll it'll still be the you know three four players that have consistently been in the mix in in the thoughts of Andy Farrell that will um, that will play in October November. When it comes to Ulster, this is the golden ticket opportunity. Be Connacht this weekend. You're assured of a place in the semis, and you can probably rotate a bit against Leinster because you know, not unlike Leinster, Ulster got to be thinking about that trip to France coming up next month and how they're going to actually work their squad because two very important players are now missing in Balakoon and also you say Ian Henderson is probably out of that quarter final given that he's had surgery and they expect five to six weeks for him to come back. In all likelihood Ulster have to be very careful about how they manage their minutes over the next few weeks too. Yeah they do and and, and Will Addison as well um, you know has that back injury that seems to be um, niggling at him. Um, so yeah I, I think they will. What, what they want to do is they want to get their victory on, on Sunday and not worry about needing to pick up um, losing bonus points um, rather than focusing on, on having two games to, um, to qualify. They'll want to do it in game one and then give themselves the opportunity to play certain players in, in the second game um, with a view to then going on and, um, and playing in a, in a semi-final and then subsequently in a, in a quarter-final uh, down in Toulouse as well and, and really focus on that. Um, it does become about squads um, when you've got a cluster of fixtures like this and where you need to play your, um, your best team in consecutive weeks. But if you are given the opportunity to rest one or two key players, you, you absolutely jump at that chance. And, um, and, one, and Ulster will try and get the job done on, on Sunday and, and give themselves the, the chance of, um, of, of resting the, the, the key players that are going to, pay, uh, that are going to play a, a vital role in the coming weeks if they're going to get into any uh, European semi-final or, or into any um, Pro 14 final. Mm, I have my suspicions these interprovincials might work a bit like the Christmas fixtures where you get an A team on one week and a B team on the other week depending on what motivation is required over the next uh, seven days or so. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens there. The international window is coming up as well, Brian. As you mentioned, we've got this new competition where every team is going to be assured of four matches this winter, three pool games and then a fourth fixture to finish things out. Uh, you've got the two Six Nations games to be completed as well. It's an interesting and quite different winter ahead for Andy Farrell and his selection team here. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, they, they would never have had a, a run of games like this other than in a World Cup. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity. As much as um, the players will have really struggled over the last number of months, Andy Farrell and his coaching ticket would as well. And there's only so much tape that they can look at um, and only so much they can um, prepare um, against sides that they're going to be facing in, in October, November. So... Um, yeah, they, they'll be enthused by games um, being played in, uh, in the Aviva uh, this weekend and a great opportunity to see um, who's going to hit form immediately and who's going to be uh, top of their reckoning um, for, for automatic selection. There's, there's key positions like John Cooney, you know, listening to him again last night, um, 
talking to Joe, he, he sounds very confident. He sounds like a player that is really buzzing to be back playing. And it continues the, that pressure on Conor Murray to deliver against Leinster on Saturday, knowing that he's breathing down his neck. So there's lots of those, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one battles um, against players that will be hoping to vie for, for a starting 15 jersey in the first game for Ireland. But um, exciting times knowing that there's so many high-quality international games coming uh, along with European games and knockout games in, um, in the, in the uh, Pro 14. So, yeah, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's a much more exciting time of year rather than September, October, when you're just kicking things off and people are finding their feet. People are going to be trying to find their feet, but if they don't, they're going to be out of these competitions, which puts a completely different complexion on things. I think with John Cooney as well, Brian, I was listening to him last night, he was unfortunate in that he was ready for a starting berth in the game against Italy, and at the games at the Aviva Stadium against Wales and Scotland, there was an excitement even when it came up on the big screen that he was warming up because his form for Ulster going into the Six Nations was outstanding and the feeling was that he had earned that start against Italy and then obviously the pandemic put pay to that. And obviously also the, you know, the performance against, uh, against England wasn't what you know, any of those players involved would have, um, would have expected and, and you know, maybe there was an opportunity for there to be a number of changes. But the complexion of that changes too because... Because they, uh, you know, they they now have had this six month break where you know you almost revert back to zero, and everyone is going from a starting point. You almost forget what happened in that English performance, and now uh, whoever delivers in the first few games will be the ones that get the the starting berth in, in the international team, and and that's why the likes of Cooney and the likes of Conor Murray will be um, really hungry to perform uh, from the off. Uh, John Cooney, no doubt. Um, there's talk about him being the Lions' number nine. You know, first and foremost, he has to continue his form for Ulster and then get into that Irish team and try and make that number nine jersey his own. Uh, and if he can do that and Ireland can be successful, then maybe he can have bigger aspirations as the season goes on. Brian, on a very final note, your former teammate, Fergus McFadden, who appears to be extremely popular among any of his teammates, to talk about the work he gets through. Unfortunately, he's picked up this injury, which is going to keep him out for five or six weeks. There's a possibility he's already played his last game for Leinster. How good was Fergus McFadden? I don't mean to write his rugby obituary here, but realistically, it's going to be a big fight for him to get back. It is, and it's funny. It catches so many players. You know, caught Dan Carter um, you know, during the, the most recent um, you know, rugby down in New Zealand, the hope of him playing for the, for the Blues, but he was, he was having calf issues it's the one thing that cut me towards the end of my career and catches so many other players the old man calf syndrome um and unfortunately the timing seems pretty brutal the players sounded pretty devastated for him knowing that if it's a five or six week injury it's um it's it's unlikely that he's going to have an opportunity to to play for for leinster again but what a i think it's 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 all the different components to ferg you know he's um He's such a battler. Um, he's, um, he, as I said before, he's someone for the hard ground, but he's someone for conditions like you know the last couple of days. He's a, he's a guy for all weather, um, but he's a, he's the heart um, heart and soul of the dressing room as well. And the biggest laugh on a night out, and it's very rare that you have a player that pulls all of that together. So, yeah, he'll be a huge loss for uh, for Leinster. Uh, but here's hoping that he'll he managed to get back in three or four weeks and he gets a little bit of a cameo because he, he deserves um, the opportunity to, um, to say goodbye properly and hopefully with a, a little bit of Leinster silverware. We'll see what happens with both him and Rob Kearney. Brian, thanks a million. Our rugby coverage, of course, here on Off the Ball with thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everybody in. We'll take a short break. Golf Weekly when we return. Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. This weekend on News Talk. We're getting fired up at the Arnott Summer Sale. With further reductions of up to 70% off, ends this Sunday. The Arnott Summer Sale. Shop in store and online at arnott's.ie. 
At Guaranteed Irish, we believe enterprise is at the heart of thriving communities. Like Black Knight, the number one Irish web host. From small beginnings in 2003, today Black Knight hosts more Irish websites than anyone else, offering email, domains and a range of business services. Operating locally and trading internationally, the Black Knight team in Carlo supports 84,000 customers in 130 countries. Guaranteed Irish welcomes companies that are altogether better choices for our communities. So look out for it. GuaranteedIrish.ie. All together better. Everyone wants to make the most of their home this summer. And the Easy Living Interior Summer Sale has something for everyone. From kitchen table bakers <laughs> to on-trend homemakers. From relaxing armchairs <sighs> to luxury beds and homewares. From dining al fresco to homeworking al desco. Shop online or visit our reopened stores in Cork, Waterford, Navan, Nace, Sandyford, Drogheda and Wexford. Easy Living Interiors. Summer Sale. Extended till Sunday. 30 days hath September. But before we get there, please remember, for all 31 days of August, we're giving you a head start on September's 2% VAT reduction across Skoda's entire range. Why wait when you can visit your local dealer today? Terms and conditions apply. Visit skoda.ie. At Centra, we have everything you need. Like Centra Irish Sirloin Steak, save 33%, now 11.38 per kilo. Nestle Cheerios 800 gram, half price, now 2.84. And our mega deal until Sunday, Last Moraz Data Wine Range, only 8 euro each. 